just want to add that um, at a time to be determined, we will have a special commissioning for Daniel and Laurel as uh, as that is planned. We'll we'll certainly share details of that uh, with you. Just want to um, call your attention in the bulletin to an insert that speaks about uh, parables. Just some information that you will find, I believe you'll find helpful uh, in this process of uh, looking together at um, these parables of Jesus. Certainly the 13th chapter of Matthew is full of these parables, but there are many others throughout Scripture that uh, these uh, principles and uh, questions on the insert will be helpful as you seek to understand and interpret the meaning of parables. Uh, as your Bibles are open to Matthew chapter 13, we're going to be looking at a number of different passages, although we're not going to get there just yet, but that there will be opportunity for us to read through and look together at some of these uh, stories, these parables of Jesus. You know, we think about um, these parables, our focus, Jesus' focus really is he's helping us, his disciples understand, is that these are stories, parables that, that give us pictures uh, of or descriptions, depictions of the kingdom of God. And it's important for us to recognize um, that as we continue in this study from Matthew chapter 13. When we think about kings and, and kingdoms, different pictures, different images come to mind. Uh, everything from uh, the pageantry of the British monarchy, which of course is in the news with a wedding, a royal wedding coming up in the not too distant future. Uh, everything from, from that to the fictional world of Disney princesses and Tolkien's wizardry. Faithful individuals whether adherents or even casual observers of things like kings and kingdoms, queens and, and their domains, are often influenced by the allurement of such things, whether it's by the allurement of um, wealth or power or influence, or caught up in the happily ever after ending that so many of us pine for an ending that typically escapes many people in real life circumstances. Such images, of course, present uh, a kingdom that is, that is only imaginable to us from, a, from afar, never anything that we could ever hope to experience for ourselves. And in contrast to those wonderful images that bring smiles to our faces and joy to our hearts stands, of course, the, the other end of the spectrum, the vileness of evil empires, of dictators and despots whose rule is often at the expense of others, whose kingdom is often characterized by cruelty and, and hatred, whose ruthless practices often put people down rather than seek to elevate and encourage others. So much so that people want nothing to do with kingdoms like that, or kingdoms at all for that matter, or they want a kingdom that will put an end to all of these kinds of kingdoms to thwart their purposes in order that personal desires might be fulfilled. Such was the case in the days in which Jesus lived, walked this earth and taught and ministered God's word. People were under the influence of a kingdom that was ruthless leaders that were evil, and that would be an understatement, vile, cruel, hatred-filled people leading at the expense of others. You know, we sometimes think that kingdoms are of a bygone era as if they just are things of the past. Do you know there are still kingdoms in this world today? 
And I read recently of uh, one king in particular, King Maswati III, M. Swati, really. Just last week, this monarch who rules Swaziland and has done so since he was 18 years old back in 1986, did something simply because he could do something. He has the power, supreme power. He changed the name of his country. He just up and changed the name of his country. It is no longer Swaziland. And some of you are saying, I've heard of that, but I've got no clue where it is. It's in Southern Africa. In case you're wondering, it's now the kingdom of E. Swatini. <laughs> if you didn't hear that, Jim said, that's no better. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, Jim. But you and I don't have the power to change it. None of us do, of course. But he, this king, has absolute power. And we kind of think of kingdoms in that, in that way. You know, either something that, that has a, a great deal of, of delight for us in terms of the kind of um, magical and mystical world uh, that... I think many of us would pine for, or we think of this, uh, this opposite end of the spectrum where, where kingdoms are, are ruled by evil people and they just at a whim do whatever they choose to do. Well, in Matthew 13, the stories that are told by Jesus are stories of, of all things, a kingdom. And specifically, the kingdom of God. And sometimes we have great mis misunderstanding and misconception about what the kingdom of God is really all about, what the kingdom of heaven, and those words, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, are really used interchangeably and synonymously. And Jesus is speaking in this uh, 13th chapter of the mysteries of this kingdom. He began in that chapter, as we looked at last week, with the parable of the sower, or as I said, the parable of the sower, the soils, and the seed, because all elements of that parable are integrally important and connected. And Jesus is saying through that parable that, that the, the seeds of the word of God, the gospel message, must be sown, and that when it finds receptive hearts, that it takes root and bears much fruit. Well, in the many generations that have passed since the parable was, was taught by Jesus, we find that there have been volumes of seed sown. That the gospel has gone forth throughout the world for generation after generation after generation. Now, I want you to stop and think for just a moment. What might have been the result had the gospel stopped going forth had you never ever heard the gospel message in other words that the seed of the gospel stopped short of reaching you and begin to think about the difference that the gospel has made in your life. Why? Because like a seed, it was sown. And praise God, because it found good soil where that seed of the gospel was able to take root and affect a transformation in your life that is ongoing, that is still bearing fruit. Because that's what God does. You see, the seed doesn't have the ability to determine whether or not it is going to bear fruit. It, it bears fruit. That's what a seed does. It, it bears fruit. But it requires someone sowing that seed. And obviously, God is the one who oversees that seed's um, sowing and, it, and, it's, and the soil in which it, it finds um, a home and the effect of the, uh, of the fruitfulness of that seed. That's God's doing. That's God's work. Now, as you're thinking about that, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the lives of people around you not being impacted 
by the gospel because you are not sowing gospel seed. See, we often think about the impact of the gospel, perhaps not often enough, but, but when we get thinking about these things, we think about the powerful impact of the gospel, how, how, how my life, how your life has been changed by God through the gospel. But that's not all that it's supposed to do, as if changing my life was enough. The gospel is intended to change many lives, to continue to affect a change. And if you and I are not sowing the seeds of the gospel, others are not being impacted because of it. And that causes me great concern. Personally, I don't have to look anywhere else but in the mirror and think about whether or not I'm sowing gospel seed as God has called me to sow. And what about your life as a witness for Jesus Christ? You see, the sower of the seed of the gospel is one who lives their life in Christ in such a way that God uses to bless the lives of others. That's the power of the gospel. I don't have the power to tra change any person. I can... I can encourage people to change. You and I can, can talk with others about the importance of change, but only the gospel has the power to transform a life because that's the work of God. That's what God does. And God's work hasn't stopped. And no one is without excuse. Well, God, I'm sorry. I just, you know, I'm just not, I don't have a green thumb. That's not what we're talking about here. You don't have to be an expert gardener to sow the seeds of the gospel. You live your life in Christ. And Jesus Christ uses your life and he uses my life as a, as a living testimony. The problem, I think, in greater part is that our lives are not fruitful. And I think it's because we don't understand the kingdom of God the way that the scriptures desire for us uh, to understand it and the way God desires for us to understand it through the scriptures. So I want to take a look at some uh, aspects of the kingdom of God here in these remaining parables of Matthew 13. Because it's here that, we, that Jesus reinforces our understanding of this, of this kingdom of God. It's a kingdom that's not of this world. It's a kingdom that's not at all like worldly kingdoms, either real or make-believe. These are descriptions of various aspects of the kingdom that we'll see. So let's begin looking at the parable of the weeds, or known also as the parable of the tares, starting at verse 24, reading through verse 30. Matthew is speaking, and he's speaking about Jesus. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seeds in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no. Lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, one of the principles about parables is that we, we want to keep in mind that oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes there, there is indication within the parable or surrounding the parable contextually in terms of the meaning of the parable. And so here, much like with the sower, we see Jesus giving us the interpretation, the meaning, the understanding of the parable. So look down with me at verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. 
Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So we see that now Jesus has given the, the interpretation, the, the explaining the meaning of this particular parable. All the details are clearly set forth. He first of all speaks of sowing the seed. He says the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who, who sowed good seed in his field. And of course what happens? As that good seed takes root, there is a, a crop. But the problem of course is that it isn't only good seed that's been sown, it's been evil seed, bad seed that's been sown. So the crop, that is the wheat is actually surrounded by what's called the weeds. Now, I want you to have a, a little different understanding because oftentimes when we have gardens, uh, whether it's flower, flower beds or, or vegetable gardens, we know what the weeds look like because they're vastly different from the plants for the most part. Not in every case, of course, and especially in the case of this parable, what Jesus was talking about here, as he referred to the tear, T-A-R-E, is a reference to what is known as the common vetch. If you're at all into agriculture, into gardening, you understand the common vetch, which in the Greek is literally called the bearded darnel. <coughs> Now I know I'm talking in terminology that you probably never thought you'd hear in a Sunday morning uh, time of uh, uh, message and conversation from God's word. A bearded darnel. Please let that, do not let that be the only thing you remember today. A bearded darnel was a kind of grass. It's the only species of the grass family that has poisonous seeds. Interestingly enough. So I read. Now, if you eat these seeds, you'll get a stomach ache, and then you'll get nauseous, and then you'll have convulsions, and the potential is great for you to be poisoned because that's the effect of this seed. It is poisonous. It's a powerful illustration of what Jesus is doing here in terms of revealing to us what Satan's work is in the hearts of people, because when a person believes the lies of Satan, they are sick and poisoned by the influence of this uh, adversary as truth is choked out. What's most interesting, and I saw this, we, a number of us who traveled over to, um, to Israel saw this, uh, in a field where there was wheat. And, uh, and it's quite interesting because, of course, you see this field and, and it's beautiful with its wheat. But what we didn't realize, at least what I didn't realize, I was also seeing, in addition to the wheat, I was seeing the tares. I was seeing the weeds. Why? Because there's such striking similarity between the wheat and the tares, it's very hard to distinguish the difference. In other words, sometimes what is counterfeit looks real. And only those who are familiar with, with the real thing, the, the genuine thing, understand when something is counterfeit. It looks the same, but it's not. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. You see, the parable of the weeds is designed to teach that spiritual truth can be choked out by counterfeit truth. And so many of us, as Christians, believe things that we somehow, somehow, have allowed to influence our, our whole perception of, of the way that we live our lives, even in terms of our faith. How many of you said this morning, either to yourself or to someone else, it's time to go to church? Because that's what we typically do. We go to church as if somehow this building is the church. But all of you who have heard me long enough understand that no, that's not the case. This is just a building. The building is insignificant. Oh, praise God for it. Thank God for the fact that we've had people who have given of themselves, of their energy, of their resources. 
that we have this building. But this, if the building was gone, the church would still be here. Why? Because we are the church. The church is people, the people of God. Let me give you another illustration of what I'm talking about. It's the belief that God loves all people unconditionally. Now, you've heard me talk about God's unconditional love, but let me qualify what I'm saying this morning. This belief that God loves all people unconditionally, it's not true. It's not true that God loves all people unconditionally. It is true that God loves his children unconditionally. But it is also true that not all people are the children of God. Therefore, not everyone is loved unconditionally. You see, we sometimes believe things that look real, that sound true, when in fact there's a measure of, only a measure of truth, but not truth in, par, in full. And Jesus, I believe, is giving this parable to remind us that spiritual truth can be choked out. We have got to stay in the word of God, hearing what God is saying, not merely what others are saying God is saying, but hearing it for ourselves. Don't ever believe what I tell you because I'm the one telling you. Because I'm just like you. I'm the same uh, the same as you are in terms of, of our humanity. And we have to remember that God and his word alone uh, is what is true. The second parable we see comes to us from verses 31 through 33. So let's look together at those verses. And so we see in verses 31 through 33, Jesus, he put another parable before them, Matthew says, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Sometimes we have difficulty understanding the parables, and one of the things we have to remember is that the parables were set in the context of the culture in which they were given. I said that uh, last week as well. The parables of the mustard seed and the leaven have to do with the influence of the kingdom. Just as a mustard seed is tiny, in fact, it's been described as the size of the head of a pin. That's how tiny it is. Microscopic. And leaven, of course, leaven Yeast, for our purposes of understanding what is being conveyed here, uh, is seemingly of little to no significance. It's just this powdery substance. What is that? But yet, the influence of such things, meaning the influence of the kingdom, is far greater. You see, the, in the influence of the kingdom of God increases both outwardly and inwardly. It may have small beginnings, Jesus says, but its influence will increase. In fact, it began as something microscopic, something so tiny, but now it's vast. It's huge. As sometimes a child will say, it's ginormous. So indeed is the influence of the kingdom of God. But it isn't so much an exterior or outward influence only in as much as it's an, in, uh, an in, uh, influence within that is, the fact that as leaven is sown into, uh, into dough, so it causes it to rise. It changes it, changes it cons uh, considerably, does it not? And so it is with the kingdom of God that the influence of God's kingdom is on individuals as well as it is in terms of, uh, of the, the numbers of individuals in as much as it's on the individual's change within. You see, so many in Jesus' day were clamoring for a kingdom that would change the way that, that people were ruled. Uh, the, the, the Rome as a, an empire was oppressive and people were longing for the messianic kingdom when God would put an end to all of that and bring peace to his people. Well, what we see here is that God changes hearts. He works within. In fact, God changes hearts before he ever changes appearances if he ever changes an appearance. You see, sometimes we say, well, a person has to get themselves cleaned up before God will even consider them. But that, of course, is, is entirely wrong. God doesn't expect you to have to change the way that you, that you look on the outside. 
Because it's about who he's made you on the inside and who he's making you to be as he's transforming you from the inside out. One of the significant differences that, that the gospel affects in terms of a change that Jesus Christ produces in a life is joy. You see, when so many of us are, are just mired in the, in the miserable mess of our lives and our thinking is all askew and we don't, sometimes just don't know which way is up and, and which way is down, whether something's right or whether something's wrong. Listen, there's a, there's a joy that comes when Jesus Christ lives within us because it's his joy. And that is one of the things that I think is, is, is the earliest evidence of God having taken root and the seed of the gospel bearing fruit in a person's life. Their countenance reflects the Christ, that Christ is present in them. I want to go on just to simply say that it's not about habit changes, it's about heart changes. And the gospel influence in a culture works often in the very same way where Christians, where followers of Jesus are, are, are called to act as agents of change, where the culture is transformed uh, uh, from within. And much like a little le leaven or yeast and the dough rises and, and a tiny seed and, a, and an amazing harvest, so it is that, that this is the activity of God on the earth. Where slowly and silently, but, but powerfully and mightily, the kingdom of God moves forward, unstoppable. We sing about that occasionally, unstoppable God, unchangeable God. We're talking about the kingdom of God, something that cannot be per perceived with eyes uh, that, uh, and confined to a realm uh, that is tangible, but something that exceeds, far exceeds our understanding and in whose influence it is so great that it has the power to change every life, one life at a time. Think about this. Jesus goes on to give some more uh, parables. Let's look quickly at uh, 40, verses 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. I, I was down in South Carolina this past uh, end, mid to the end of the week, and I was there attending a conference, and it turns out that uh, the Sullivan family has some land. I tried to sell that, by the way, Mike. I'm sorry, I didn't seem to have great success. I probably should have used this text and say, you know, there was buried treasure in this piece of land that the Sullivan family has for sale. Maybe that would have helped. I don't know. But the point is, there's a piece of land that, that there's a treasure in. There's something significant about this, about this land. So, these, these two short parables make it clear that really they're teaching the same lesson. And the, the lesson is this, the kingdom, of, the kingdom of God is of inestimable value. There's something valuable, something precious about the kingdom of God. You see, the treasure and the pearl represent Jesus Christ and the salvation that he offers. And I don't want to get into all the details, but I want to suggest to you that there's something that's worth giving everything else for. I remember as a kid, I used to go to auctions with my father on Saturday nights. And um, I remember going to an auction one time and these people who were sitting somewhere in front of us bought this painting and, and paid like this ridiculous amount of money for this painting that, that was, wasn't anything. It wasn't like a, a wonderful piece of art you'd want to hang. I think it was, it was kind of marred and the frame was kind of broken. And I thought, why on earth would you pay so much? And I don't remember how much it was, but it, it seemed like a lot. And I remember as soon as that person, uh, that woman got that picture, she opens up the back of, the, of, of the, the backing to that picture. I thought, what on earth is she doing? She knew exactly what she was doing. She knew, or at least she suspected, that there was treasure hidden between the, the painting and the backing whether it was a paper backing or cardboard backing, I don't recall. And sure enough, she reached in there and she pulled out old money. Apparently, years ago, it must have been a common practice for people to put money in places where it would be for safekeeping. And these were old paper bills and probably worth much more money than their face value. 
She, she paid a lot because she knew there was something there. Jesus is saying, look, the kingdom of God is worth pouring everything you have into it because the return on your investment is going to far exceed your wildest imagination. In other words, the kingdom of God is not like anything else that you can ever imagine it to be. Wow. That's incredible. You see, there's something about the gospel that, that, that makes it a treasure. There's something about the kingdom of God that makes it of inestimable worth. There's something about this whole thing that we have become part of by the grace of God that should compel us to say, you know what? I'm willing to, to surrender my life and give all that I am and all that I have that the gospel might continue to change lives, that the kingdom of God might grow, that the kingdom of God and its influence, the influence of Jesus Christ, would so transform more and more lives. And you know what I wrestle with? Perhaps you do too. I feel like I've got to hold on to what I've got. I don't want to lose it. And I know that God is calling me at times to, to surrender more of myself to him and, and give more of my, of my resources to him, but I'm still holding tightly to those things. Why? Because I have my own kingdom that I want, to, uh, oh, I want to preserve. I want my own purposes to prevail. I want to be the king. I never heard of a King Glenn. See, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we relinquish all of that because we recognize that his authority is greater and his kingdom mightier and more meaningful, more valuable, more precious. And so it is with the work of the gospel, something so precious. There's the parable of the net. The parable of the net, I'm not going to actually take time to read because it really reflects in a lot of ways, the similar, is similar to the parable uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of the weeds or the tares. It's a great image there of those who are fishing, casting forth their nets and the separation of the good and the bad fish. And Jesus is basically saying it's going to be that way at the end of the age when, when God causes uh, the judgment to take place. A day of reckoning is coming. That's the bottom line of that point. But I want to get to the last part of this as we bring this time to a close this morning. Verses 51 and 52. Because it doesn't quite seem to fit. It's not consistent. It's not another parable. It doesn't quite seem to fit, but I want to read it. Verses 51 and 52. Jesus said, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. It's rather interesting because it doesn't seem to fit. I mean, it makes sense, I suppose, that Jesus is asking his disciples, do you understand? He's just been talking in parables. Do you understand? So let me ask you this morning. Do you understand? I mean, no, not do you get every bit, but are you tracking with me? Do you understand? Let me see some heads that you understand this morning, if you do. Don't, don't pretend. Do you? Do you really understand? Listen, what Jesus was asking was not to affirm them, to compliment them. Like, hey, good job, guys. You understood. Finally. You know, it's only taken three years. <laughs> now, again, that's not the time frame, and I'm just kind of embellishing this quite a little bit. But I want to suggest to you this. The disciples didn't have a clue. And in all honesty, I don't think we do either. And I don't mean to demean any of you who answered that you kind of understand. Maybe you were somewhat more obliging to me than you should have been especially if you knew it was a trick. I didn't tell you it would be. But really, to stop and think about this, why is it that we know that Jesus wasn't necessarily encouraging them? Because what does he do? He calls them scribes. He calls them scribes. Do you realize that the scribes were, were not viewed as, a, as a, a group that you want to really be called? I mean, to call you a scribe is not like a, a compliment. That's not why Jesus, he wasn't saying, hey, great job, guys. You're, you're scribes. You know, like, ooh, that's, that's good. 
Jesus was not doing that whatsoever because the scribes, and we, we can get really off track on this one, but the scribes were enemies of Jesus. The scribes were one of three classes of people who opposed Jesus in his ministry. The others were the chief priests and the Sanhedrin the Pharisees. The scribes were part of that group. So why would Jesus say to his disciples that, why would he call them scribes? Because there was something positive about the scribes, that a trait within them. You see, they were trained in the understanding of Scripture. And disciples must understand what the kingdom of God is, is like. And the only way to understand the kingdom of God is to, is to get into the word of God so that we can understand the truth of God. And there's no excuse for us not doing that, but yet we all have excuses. You can understand the ways of God's kingdom. You can learn the mysteries of the kingdom of God. They're not intended to be kept mysteries. They're intended to be mysteries that you will understand. So that you can distinguish what is true from what is false. Because the problem is, so many of us have bought into a lie. And that lie says many different things, but it speaks to us individually. It says when we're looking in the mirror, you, <laughs> uh, you are, 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 are just a phony. You're just putting on a show. If anybody knew, if anybody knew who you really were, they would never be your friends. They wouldn't want anything to do with you. Now, maybe you've never thought that. But maybe what you thought doesn't come from looking in the mirror, but it comes from looking around you when you see other people and you say, well, I'm glad I'm not like them. I'm glad my family is not the mess that their family is. Maybe you've been there. Or maybe, or maybe there's been some other thought that you've had that, that, that you have just really, really struggled with. Listen, it's because we are not hearing the word of God and understanding the things of God that pertain to the king and the kingdom itself. Because it's not one of us who's worthy. There's not one of us who's got it all figured out. There's not one of us who doesn't struggle with something that, that just plagues us. It doesn't matter who we are or what it is. And, and you, can't, you can't wash your cares away. You can't make them disappear. You, we can try. We can run from our problems, but they catch up with us. Can't run that fast. Our reality is such that that's... But God knows that. God understands that. God says, that's why I, 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 I've given you the answer. The person, Jesus, who's died for your sin, who's died not because you're worthy, but because you're unworthy. Not because you're lovable, but because you're unlovable. Not because you're good, but because you're sinful. Not because you're perfect, because you're so imperfect. And your life is such a mess, as good as it may seem to you by comparison to others. And the reality is that God, God has sent his son to die for you. Man, that's incredible. Am I worthy of that? Absolutely not. Will I ever be worthy of that? Never will I be worthy of that. But praise God, I don't have to be, and you don't have to be. Because that's what God's grace and mercy are all about. 1 John 5.20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. I never saw this verse this way before. That we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his son Jesus Christ, for he is the true God and eternal life. This is the good news of the gospel. And I invite you to hear the call of the kingdom. Hear the call of the kingdom. And recognize your place in submission to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus himself, and to living and serving this King for the glory of his name. Will you pray?